this next section, we're going to be talking about government and social structure. Honestly, when civilizations become more complex and they grow and the more modern they become, the less delineated or the less separated government, social structure, and religion become. So as we go through these sections, you're going to notice the same thing is true with ancient Egypt. Egyptian society and Egyptian government were a hierarchy, particularly a social hierarchy. And I've chosen this particular illustration because you can see that the larger number of people tend to be at the base of the social hierarchy and wealthier people and people like the pharaoh are at the top and they are far fewer in number. Let's start our lesson on the pharaoh. The pharaoh was the political, the religious, and the economic leader of the Egyptians. He had, as pharaoh, total political power. And his spoken commands became law. So in addition to all of that, he's also the supreme commander for the military. So he had training in all of those things, and they started at a very young age. Religiously, the pharaoh was believed to be a god. He was considered the son of Ra, or the earthly version of Horus, and you saw that in the introduction in the previous podcast. The pyramids were built in Egypt to ensure the pharaoh could reign in the afterlife. So he not only controlled the Egyptians' lives on earth, but he also helped them in the afterlife. Economically, the pharaoh was again the key figure in Egypt. Egyptians believed and they felt that the pharaoh symbolically owned everything. That means he owned all the land, all the people, and all the possessions. And pretty much it was through his graciousness, his generosity, and his god small g behavior that he granted people the right to use those things for their survival. So although the pharaoh directly controlled the vast majority of the land, royal officials managed it for him. Some nobles were personally able to own small portions of the land, but other lands that were not given to the nobles were set aside for temples, and the temples were the basis of their entire religion. So you can see how the government, the social structure, and now the religion actually start to fold together. The pharaoh collected large amounts of taxes that he used for large government projects, such as building temples and pyramids. But he also used the taxes to pay the wages of the people who worked within the government. So these taxes paid the wages of people like skilled workers, scribes, artisans, military general and military personnel and it paid for large projects that were done by the peasants during the time of flooding. When the lands were flooded, as you can see in the picture on the, on the screen, they couldn't do much of anything else. So the farmers would have been sitting idle. This gave them a chance to kind of give back to their government and serve their pharaoh by donating their time. However, people who pay taxes paid for the projects. These folks just got to donate their time. In the Egyptian kingdom, the vizier, shown at the level on the screen with the arrow, was the second most important official. The viziers were usually picked from the ranks of the scribes and was the pharaoh's most trusted advisor. The vizier often oversaw many of the key functions of government, including those massive building projects, the state libraries, or as they're sometimes known as, as the state archives, which is where all the important documents are stored, and the state's legal system, which is their court system. The next level in the social structure are the nobles. And the nobles in Egyptian society were related to the pharaohs. They could have been related to the religious priests, 
scribes, doctors, lawyers, or important military personnel, which would be something along the lines of a general. Many of the nobles were overseers of the land worked by the peasants. So it was their job to make sure that everybody was doing what they were need to be doing. And then they would answer to the vizier, who would then report daily to the pharaoh. Now, earlier I mentioned that the pharaoh collected taxes. Well, taxes from lands were paid to the government, not in the form of money, but in the form of crops or cattle. These crops were then, in turn, were used to pay the skilled workers and any peasants for their labor on the government projects. But there was no cash or any coinage until much, much later in Egyptian history, probably around the time of the Roman Empire. There were two types of workers that existed in ancient Egypt. Skilled craftsmen and unskilled workers. Skilled craftsmen worked year round perfecting their crafts. Some examples of skilled craftsmen in Egypt were sculptors, goldsmiths, painters, carpenters, and rock cutters. The rock cutters were the workers who cut those precision blocks, huge blocks of stone, when they did their building projects. The unskilled workers are illustrated in this slide. You can see where the arrow is pointing is where they are in the social structure. Right above them were the skilled artisans and craftspeople. And now we're looking at the unskilled, which are second from the bottom. Unskilled workers or unskilled labor were peasants who labored in large groups to accomplish very large projects and they were typically done for the government. You can see in this particular picture them working in tandem, handing things off and helping each other out. That was when they had large projects like building pyramids and temples. They needed a large labor force. It's interesting to note that they were not necessarily slaves. A group of people that shared that same second from the bottom level as the unskilled workers are the farmers. Farmers lived in houses that were made of mud brick. Their windows were built high up to give privacy and to help the heat escape. Floors were made out of packed dirt and the farmers cooked food in small ovens that were fueled by burning basically dried cattle fertilizer. It's interesting how the houses during ancient Egypt were built very similar to the earlier houses we saw in places like Turkey in Chetel Hauk. Men and boys worked in the fields irrigating crops with a shaduf, which you can see in that picture brings water from the river into a hand dug canal. It was their way of irrigating. They also spent a significant amount of time plowing the ground as you can see in the other picture where it's being pulled by a series of cows or oxen. You can tell by the horns. This was not easy labor, definitely not easy labor, and did not make for a long lifespan. The women, on the other hand, baked a lot of bread. Remember, they had a lot of grain that they grew so they could make that into bread. And then this particular statue shows an Egyptian farming woman preparing the grain to be made into bread. They also were responsible for brewing the beer. Now, Egyptian beer is nothing in terms of the alcohol content the way it is today. Brewing beer guaranteed them a reasonably safe source of drinking liquid. The women also spun thread from the cotton that they grew, which Egypt was known for its cotton. That's why we call them Egyptian cotton sheets today. And then they took those, those cotton threads and they weaved them into various items that they could use on a daily basis or trade for food or sell. In ancient Egypt, peasants comprised or made up as much as 80% of the entire Egyptian population. 
so the majority of peasants worked in the fields producing crops, while some could get work as servants in the homes of the wealthy nobles. But obviously, those are not jobs that are easily found when you consider that 80% of the population is not a noble or a wealthy person. Now, I mentioned earlier that during the times of flooding, the government sponsored large projects for peasants, farmers, and unskilled laborers to have some way of helping the government do their larger projects so they were not taken out of the fields producing food. Well, the, during the flood months of June to September, farmers, peasants, and unskilled workers were called for service to the government. Working for the government was known as corvée duty. Wealthier farmers and those holding official posts could buy their way out of this service, this corvée service. Those who did serve the corvée duty or the work worked on large projects such as temples or perhaps building a pyramid. Our last social group we're going to look at is the slaves and as you can see in the diagram on the screen the slaves were definitely at the bottom of the social government pyramid. Slaves in ancient Egypt were most commonly prisoners of war, which means the entire army and any of the families or citizens that followed the army were taken prisoner as well. Although the pyramids are often depicted as being built by slaves, there's actually very little historical evidence of this. It was not until the Middle Kingdom that large groups of slaves were present in Egypt, and we know that because there are papyruses that were maintained in their national archives that listed all of their uh, census information. During the Old Kingdom, when the pyramids were actually built, or the oldest ones were built, there is no evidence that Egypt maintained a large population of slaves at all. Slaves in ancient Egypt had far more rights than during the time of European and American slavery, which is going to come much, much later in history. For example, Egyptian slaves could own land. They could marry freeborn people, meaning people that were not born into slavery. So they could technically marry a scribe or a farmer and even employ servants. So slavery in Egypt did not mean total ownership which is associated with the later concept of slavery. It was completely different than what we know it to be in our modern day. This pretty much ends our section on this part of social structure and government. Our next podcast will be on law and order or crime and punishment, which will talk about some of the punishments and some of the crimes that are documented in ancient Egyptian papyruses.